the fall of the worlds. It was the war to end all wars. There was no one left to fight. No war memorials. No wall with the names of the dead. No statues of heroes. Only empty cities and the ruins of great civilizations on two planets. Tumbleweeds, skulls, crows. Only in Zalem did the light stay on. Who attacked first? It doesn't matter. Once it starts, there is always a wrong which needs to be righted. Always an attack which needs to be avenged. Memory is short, hatred is long, and truth is the first casualty. Humanity's failure is that it started. Our past began as one. Humans looked outward, founding colonies among the stars. Earth and Mars were the interplanetary superpowers. Man was leaping for the stars, driven not by nobility, but greed. Greed that consumed the parent worlds, pitting Mars and its interstellar colonies against Imperial Earth. And they went to war. Not a war for independence, but a war for all the marbles. Two civilizations, linked by history, but alien to each other, incompatible, and fighting for the same resources. There were two planets throwing rocks at each other like little kids, but such rocks they threw. In the grand expansion across the galaxies, man had mastered matter and energy and time itself, but learned no wisdom and found no peace. For with the mastery of matter and energy came fearsome weapons. Alita was born at this moment in history. An innocent human child brought to life on Mars. She was called Yoko until the war between the planets destroyed her home and family. She was plucked for action by the Urm war machine, her brain installed in a basic titanium core and a no-frill cyborg body for adaptation and training. She was only 17. By the time her brain was transplanted into a Class I Urm Berserker compatible core, she had been identified as a high-value military asset, armed with the ultimate in 24th century cyborg technology. What role was this 17-year-old girl to play in the battle between Earth and Mars? Was she good then? Was she evil? Was she the Urm's instrument of destruction? The end game of the war came with a bioweapon penetrating Earth's defenses. Humans were dying, and the spread was unchecked. Defensive action was taken, but there were no means to contain something of this magnitude. The sky city of Zalem was sealed to prevent the virus from getting in. While the disease spread around the globe, a viral tidal wave that quickly surpassed any efforts to quell the devastation. Mortality rates rose to 70%. There was carnage in the streets. Poor and powerful alike died by the millions and lay unburied. Zalem above watched as the lights of the world went out. Returning freighters and warships were turned away for fear of contamination. Some took their chances descending to the infected planet below. Others just ran out of time and went dark. The enemy grew quiet as well. The nanobot plague counter-strike on Mars had found its mark. Refugees from every place on Earth converged on Iron City under the shadow of Zalem. Isolated from the plague, the Zalans ruled the world. The surface people grew their food and worked their factories. In return, they gave them power, medicine, technology, and the rule of law. It was a cruel system, but the beacon of Zalem gave hope for the future. The rest of the world was reclaimed by nature. The great cities collapsed and were overrun by forest. There were pockets of humanity, sometimes in the ruins of cities, sometimes in small towns and villages. They struggled with disease and starvation. Those who could do so journeyed to Iron City. Thus, Zalem has endured for three centuries. The world is at peace, a rigidly enforced one. There is no growth and no progress. Though life on the ground is mired in squalor, the Zalans float above, isolated and serene. Unaware of a lonely cyborg core, a warrior of the Forgotten War, discarded in the scrap, life still blinking within, ready to rise again.
This is Iron City. I spent my whole life here dreaming of being somewhere else. I'm the guy that can get you what you need. You work in my business, you have to know the streets. Which ones have the buried treasure, and which ones to stay out of. Barrio Purgatorio. This is Worker's Town. You live, you die, you never get ahead. I was one of those kids playing motorball over there. A lot of families around here. Watched my dad work himself into an early grave. Wasted limbs replaced by cyborg parts. Turning himself into a machine. A scrapyard. I come here all the time. You never know what you can find. Mostly I like to think about what life is like in Zalem. All this garbage comes from right up there. Factory district. This is the big industrial part of town. There's warehouses, factories, not much else. There are people who live here too. Rough crowd. Street gangs, cheap bars, lowest rent in town. A lot of stuff you don't want to know about happens in the nighttime around here. Working people have strange appetites. Barrio Viejo, lost splendor right here. Makes you wonder what this place was like before the fall. It's all built over now. Dokito's place used to be a casino. There are apartments on top of apartments, restaurants, street markets. I like being here. I like the energy. I like the bustle of people. Barrio Oscuro. It's known as the Shadow Quarter, but there's no great mystery. Just the most hours of darkness under Zalem. I'll be honest, it's pretty depressing. There are factories, there are apartments. Workers live here when they can't afford much else. Corazon de Acero. Heart of Steel. Good place to get in trouble. When I was young, we used to whisper secrets about coming here when we got old enough. The rowdiest place of all is the Kansas Bar. That's where the Hunter Warriors hang out. And anybody who wants to lose a limb in a bar fight. Barrio Latino. This is the Latin Quarter. Everybody speaks Spanish. After the fall, all the people left from South America, Central America, they ended up here. They still run the place. Barrio Asiatico. This is the Asian Quarter. Chinatown, Koreatown, Little Tokyo. Pretty flashy place. Too many people and you get a headache from all the signs. The food's good, though. Medina, the Islamic section between Claro and the Scrapyard. Also contains the African street market. Motorball Arena. This is where the action happens. The superstars of Iron City all play right here. Josh Agon, Ajakuddy. You should see this place when it's lit up for the big game. 300,000 people screaming in unison. Life isn't pretty down here in Iron City. It's messy, human, noisy. You do what it takes to survive. But you know, you look up at the great Sky City and that's a promise of hope. Right there, just out of reach. Down here, you don't make much, but it's real. Just watch out for the dark corners. It takes time to adjust to your new life. There's no going back. Now after a few years, you won't even remember your old body. Things that used to be important, well they aren't anymore. Being lethal is so much more rewarding. What does it mean to be a cyborg? Well, it's all about perspective, isn't it? Here are some things you'll never have to worry about again. Most diseases, loss of hearing or sight, body odor, bad breath, dandruff, toe jam, runny nose, sore muscles, farts, burps, vomits, hitting your funny bone, coughing, lung cancer, broken bones, diarrhea, heart attacks. All a thing of the past. I'm a hunter warrior, a bounty hunter. I work on commission, but that doesn't mean I don't enjoy it. Bounty for the cyborg was 20,000 credits. Things you still need to worry about are eating. For the curious, it all gets collected in a waste bag. You can eat as much as you like, just bring extra trash liners. Drinking, about half a litre a day will do. Eliminating your, uh, your waste. Same deal, girl squat, boy stand, but, but go wild, rig it up however you like. Everyone's got their special mods. Breathing, fear, aging, memory loss, insanity, dementia, death. <laughs> You are not immortal. Bounty for the cyborg was 20,000 credits. Yeah, some new things to worry about. Reduce sensation. Things just 
And they just don't feel the same. There's power failure, loss of lubricant, loss of hydraulic fluids, jackers. Yeah, they'll strip you of your valuable parts, unless I strip them first. Strong magnetic fields, high voltages, system viruses, and they are deadly. Bounty for 20,000 credits. Mod addiction. <laughs> yes, the need to upgrade your body is very satisfying. Now, what can I say? It's the best thing I've ever done. I look any way I want, and I choose to look like a god. Welcome to Iron City's Sport of Kings, Motorball. Gladiatorial battle as you've never seen it before. It's machine versus machine in pitched battles to the finish. It is a proliferation of ferocious machines as weapons and techniques become ever more fierce. Let's see how the game is played. Rules of the game number one. In team competition, two teams of seven compete on each side. First league standard, though in lower leagues there are three team and five team versions. Each team is allowed unlimited substitutions as long as there are never more than the initial allotment of players. Substitutions do not apply for players removed from the track on penalty. Cutthroat matches range from 5 to 12 players. No rules. Each player out for themselves. Larger variations have ranged upwards of 45 players on the track at once. Rules of the game number two. In all league play, armor or pads are required. Helmets are optional. Propulsion systems are permitted, providing review and approval of league office. There's no limit to the number of wheels used. Players must have arms and legs. No pure wheeled vehicles or tank tracks permitted. Weapons are allowed with the exception of projectiles. Projectiles include any type of gun, bow, spear, or anything not primarily attached to a player. Flamethrowers are limited to six feet. Rules of the game number three. Any players on either team can field the motorball and move forward as fast as possible to try to score points. After gaining initial possession of the ball, the offensive team cannot try for a score until the ball has traveled one revolution of the track. A defensive player is allowed to intercept the ball or scoop up the ball that has been knocked out of possession, nullifying the requirement of one revolution. The ball carrier is not allowed to deliberately hide the ball from the defensive team. The penalty for doing so is for the team to forfeit possession. A relaunch is called and the player is sent off the track and cannot be replaced during the penalty period. Only a member from the opposing team can pick up the ball and play continues. A player must not deliberately injure another player. Only biological injuries apply. Mechanical injuries are part of the game. It's the dream of every cyborg. Do they have the skill, the killer instinct to perform on the world's biggest stage? Will they rise above or come crashing down in a fiery blaze on the track of tears? They may burn only briefly before they are smashed to junk, but by God, they will have their moment of glory. 